Podcasts, The Final Frontier. These are the voyages of the podcast... There are four lights! It's five-year mission to explore strange, familiar worlds, to seek out new listeners and new civilizations, to boldly go where most nerds have gone before. Join Matt and Shirley on their five-year mission with a different guest each week as they talk about an episode of Star Trek from the original series through Enterprise. They'll cover every episode, eventually. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to There Are Four Lights. I'm Matt, and I'm here with Shirley. Hello. And we're joined by our wonderful guest, George Chimples. Hello. Uh, George, you are a... uh, one third of the lizard people over at Lizard People Dear Readers. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that podcast? That's correct. Lizard People Dear Readers is a science fiction and fantasy book club for lizard people. Uh, we talk about science fiction and fantasy books, as you might expect, discuss them, review them, and then um, in between, we also talk about some of our other pop culture fascinations. A lot of times it comes down to video games, movies, uh, music, and. We just uh, have a good time in between ruling the world as Illuminati lizard people. Uh, is it nice. difficult reading your sci-fi books by uh, gaslight underneath the earth? Well, we have, you know, we wouldn't call them human slaves, but um, we have human things that we've kind of mutated into light-giving, uh, oh, okay. bio-functional light spaces, human lamps. So, so like uh, works. lightning, lightning bugs, but humans. Lightning yeah, humans. except a lot grosser and more swollen. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, you've read such books as Bees and um, The Peripheral man. by William Gibson. Yeah, I should know that. I should know a couple others. And, and uh, yeah, it's it's a good show. I, I've listened to literally every episode that's been recorded. That's true. Even the secret ones that have been lost. Yeah, those got lost in a warehouse fire. Still, uh, still <laughs> sad about that warehouse fire. <laughs> Well, that's what happens when you record on 8-Track. Yep. Uh, All right. Well, we're going to get into the episode of the original series called the Carbomite Maneuver. No, you you still didn't get it right. Dang it. Carbomite Carbomite Maneuver. Shirley's got it. Maybe Shirley should give the plot synopsis. (laughs) Oh, dang. Okay. So, it's about this thing that flies up on the Enterprise that looks like a Rubik's Cube. Not really. It okay, looked like, I'll do see? it. I'll do the plot. I'm going to take it from here. So it looked like a the, screensaver. It did. It did. It looks like that Windows screensaver that bounces around. Yeah, yeah, that that terrible thing. Um, so the Enterprise is out doing some, you know, stellar cartography, um, and you know they they're they're farther out than they've ever been. And this is, yep. Spock said it was the furthest that, that anyone had ever been. Yeah, uh, they they come across this uh, thing that comes up on them very quickly, and then that thing um, seems to stop and block their way, and they can't get around it. And it does very much look like a Rubik's cube. It's a colored cube. Yeah, it's a colored cube, different colors, and um, and after they try and communicate with it, and that fails, and they try and go around it, that fails. The thing starts getting very close, and there's uh radiation do you want to do this i'm just making Lady. sure you don't miss anything <laughs> no there's a radiation the radiation becomes too intense as the cube gets too close and they finally fire on it destroying it completely for forever like there's not even uh they make it clear there's not even extra pieces of laying around or anything um and they kind of go on their way with the intent of kind of finding the 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 um life forms that built it and out of nowhere comes a much larger ship um they claim it's a mile across which i don't know seems kind of small for as large as that ship seemed to be yeah um but it is a large uh sphere of other spheres it looks like um and just really really makes the, the enterprise look tiny um, they find out that the the ship is run by the first, what is it, the first empire? The first federation. The first federation, that's right. Um, and it is captained by a man named Baylock, or a creature named Baylock. Um, Baylock essentially takes over their ship after threatening them, telling them that they, they, they don't understand peace or harmony or anything. And... Uh, they they move along through this this intense like ten minutes that takes like twenty five in the show, 
and it slowly goes through the 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 crew part. One of the, a member of the crew freaks out and has to be removed from the bridge, and the rest of the crew has can't figure out what to do to kind of stop it. And finally, Kirk comes up with the brilliant plan to play uh, poker with it and bluff his way out, threatening them with the fact that if they attack the ship, he the ship has a carbomite. Uh, what was it device and element that uh, if they are attacked will retaliate in uh, equal strength and destroy their ship right back um the bluff kind of pays off sort of um and they are not destroyed but a smaller ship comes off the large one uh, off of the what the fasarius yeah the fasarius um a, a smaller ship comes off of that and uh tells them that it will be towing them to the nearest habitable planet for them where they will be interned and their ship will be destroyed um as the as the smaller ship also captained by Baylock, uh kind of tows the enterprise away they begin to force their way out of the towing by ramping up their engines and exhausting the energy reserves of the smaller ship uh they finally do break and then they fi they realize that the smaller ship in in there doing that has been damaged and they've it's lost all of its engines and its, its um life support and so Kirk makes the decision to go back and save whatever crews there and help them um they board the small ship um they find who they believe Baylock is and it just turns out to be some sort of rubbery mask dummy um and it's actually all commanded by a small, child-sized uh, creature whose name is Baylock. Um, this guy, played by Clint Howard, we'll get into that in a little bit. And uh, he reveals that it was all a test to see what the true intentions of the, the, the Enterprise crew were and what, what they were doing out there to begin with. Um, after some back and forth and some discussions and some drink called Tranya... Um, uh, Baylock offers to um, kind of exchange uh, culture and information and Bailey, who freaked out earlier on the bridge um, at, um, what do you call that? Where you volunteer. He volunteers to stay on the ship with Baylock and learn about the culture and the, the species that Baylock comes from and Kirk says that it'll be a good chance for him to exchange those things and, and for Baylock to learn about humans Meanwhile, he'll get a better officer back when it's all said and done. Um, and then they tour the ship, and that's kind of the end of the episode. This one, this one had a lot of um, intense moments, but not a lot of like moving story bits. There's not a lot of. Uh, there's a lot going on. There's just not a lot of um, action and adventure kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's basically them just sitting there, waiting yeah. to die. Yeah. Um, so yeah, did I did I, did I miss anything that you, that I was is important, George? What do you think? I think the big thing is is Bailey is kind of the big secondary character, and so there's a lot of he's a character we haven't seen before. He was just it's he's just a one off, but mm -hmm. that there's an introduction of him, um, the idea that Kirk's been pushing him too hard, but Kirk sees something of himself in him. That's what McCoy feels, and that he might have been promoted too early. And then he starts cracking under the pressure a couple different times mm -hmm. where he's a little bit, um, like when they first come across the, the marker that starts blocking their progress, he's like, we should just blow it up. And Kirk's like, that's a little impetuous. And if I want your you know advice, I'll ask for it. And he's almost a little bit borderline. Um, what's the word for it? It doesn't matter. He, he's a little bit impetuous and, but he also he when when it's clear that Baylock's ship is more powerful and has theirs, you know, dead to rights, he starts freaking out and freezing, and he can't even like manipulate the controls and do his job as the navigator. And so at that point, Kirk yeah. is like, "You need to go to the brig," and McCoy kind of has it out with him. But his kind of redemption, he comes back to the bridge when the countdown is at like five seconds and asks to retake his place, and then volunteers to go and explore all this stuff with this weird baby man. You know, yeah. kind of redeems him. <laughs> Um, this is the third episode that was filmed, um, but um, it is placed as episode eleven after the after everything else that came before this. So after the after the two pilots, this was the first official episode that was uh, filmed. 
Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. So actually, this is like the first. This this is the first time we see Sulu and Uhura, and there's another character. Um, like th- three main Yeoman Rand. Uh, uh, yeah, Scotty. Rand. I'm sorry, Uhura, McCoy, McCoy, and Rand. This is the first time they debut here. Debut. Um, Scotty was actually in the previous episode with oh, okay. Sulu, and Sulu has been has gone from the science division where he was uh, in charge of physics or whatever. Botany. To, oh well, and botany. <laughs> so now he's part of the command division. So there, there's some changes that they're they're making, which I don't know keeps us from feeling stable. Um, Uhura has a yellow or has a gold uniform on. Mm-hmm. We can talk about that a little bit later. But there's a lot of stuff going on here. Sulu in the, in the meta of it all. Sulu comes across, by the way, is just totally amazing. I loved him just kind of doing stuff off to the side where like yeah. when Bailey freezes up and, you know, Kirk's like, we need you to plot something and you need to do it. And Sulu just kind of reaches over, hits some buttons and is like, plot laid in, Captain. And he's just so great at those little moments. And then mm-hmm. when they start, when the ship, when, when Balak says, you know, you've got 10 minutes to live, make your peace with whatever gods you believe in. And Sulu just starts this running countdown. And at this one point, Bailey just starts flipping out. And he's like, why aren't any of you guys doing anything? And he's counting down. And he's just, and Sulu's just like, yeah, whatever. That's what I'm doing. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's, let's get into the notable guest stars. I think the big one is Clint Howard, uh, who played, the the baby man child thing that was Baylock. Uh, uh, Brock Lesnar's baby. Brock Lesnar. <laughs> Brock Lesnar's you know, future babies. That is a there totally different podcast. We can talk about that on. Um, <laughs> but uh, Clint Howard, you'd know from a dozen things. I mean, he was all over the place. Uh, he's that weird looking guy that happens to be. Uh, he's in a Ron lot of Howard's Ron brother. Howard movies for some reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're uh, they are brothers. Uh, he was in um, the Andy Griffith Show a few times. Um, he's been in a lot of stuff. Uh, he's the voice of Rue in some of the Winnie the Pooh stuff. Um, That's weird. Yeah, I know, right? Um, but yeah, he he's been in quite what's, a bit of things. What's quite been a few recent. Things. What now? What's recent? Uh, what's for him? recent? Uh, bald. He was in Bald. He was in Hawaii Five O as the superintendent. This isn't recent, but Rock and Roll High School, um, Apollo Thirteen. Oh. Speaking of things that he was in that Ron Howard had something to do with, he was in Arrested Development. Yes. <laughs> um, let's see. Wow, nothing. Uh, connect Star Wars as Girly Vader. I'm not joking. Or, I'm sorry, Connect any Star Wars as Girly Vader as General. He was the general on that. He was in Blubberella. Yikes. Blood Rain, the Third Reich. Okay, those are all Uwe Boll movies. <laughs> are they really? Yes. Both um, of those are. <laughs> Uh, he was in Curious George follow, 2, Follow That Monkey. Oh, he was at Night of the Museum. Fair enough. That's that's decently important. Um, yeah, so he's been... Uh, you would When when we saw him as an adult, we were like, oh, now it's that, that guy. guy. Oh, he, he, he revised his role as Baylock at the Comedy Central roast of William Shatner. Nice. <laughs> it's Clint Howard, <laughs> and awesome. this is perhaps a mean thing, but Clint Howard is an ugly man who was an ugly child, and he looks basically the same. And it's yeah. kind of freaky. Well, uh, the... I don't know. He, there's this picture of him with a bear, and he looks kind of like a cute, normal little seven-year-old kid. <laughs> well, like the... his teeth, which theoretically should have fallen out sometime between childhood and adulthood, <laughs> look exactly the same to me. And then they've got him in a bald cap, and since he's bald now, <laughs> the only thing that was different was like his like wicked, hyped-up eyebrows, which were tremendous special effects. Yeah, um, <laughs> Michael Dunn was actually originally considered for the role of Balok. Uh, you'd know him, oh, from all kinds of stuff, but specifically uh, in, your vagueness. in Wild Wild West, uh, he was, um, well, where'd it go? Uh, he was right Will here. Smith in Wild Wild West. He was Dr. Loveless. Oh. <gasps> actually, yeah. Um, he, he also played a couple of, uh, he played... Uh, Wait, in the original Wild Wild yes, West? Yes, he played okay. Alexander in Plato's Children of the Star Trek original series um episode um he was originally uh cast but um gene roddenberry thought someone quite quote much more weird would be more effective um hey, and that's gene? how they got clint howard <laughs> gene mission accomplished gene you yeah no it. kidding no kidding uh because he his eyebrows are red but almost translucent and yeah yeah creepy and weird and, and he, that kid the, the, when he laughs 
and he laughs at the most inappropriate moments and his whole <laughs> sequence is like maybe three minutes four minutes long but he's just so weird and he's playing a generally friendly character but he's so yeah. freaky it's really yeah crazy. it's really creepy it, it is um and, and he's seven at the time of the showing yeah. and clearly didn't do any of the voice work yeah unless yeah. if he did do the voice work that is the best voice ever <laughs> <laughs> tranya <laughs> um we also got ted cassidy came back he did the voice of the puppet uh okay. the Baylock puppet ted cassidy was in oh, what was he in he was in the one where they went down to the planet into the caves and... Mir? He was the... Miri. Miri? Yeah. Is it Miri or um, oh. What Little Girls Are Made Of? What Little Girls Are Made Of, you're right. Um, he was the, the thing there. And Ted Cassidy was also Lurch. Like, that's a big, big deal. And then the voice of Baylock when it was Ron, uh, Clint Howard pretending to be him was uh, Walker Edmiston. Uh, who's done a lot of voice work, uh, a lot of voice work. The Flintstones, Ben 10, Avatar The Last Airbender, uh, Transformers, Transformers The Movie. Um, Who was he in Transformers? Inferno. Inferno. Mm. Uh, he was uh, Fired Lord Az- Azulon in uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. So, you know, pretty important. <laughs> um but those are kind of our big stars. Uh, I'd say that uh, Lieutenant Bailey was kind of a big deal, but like he's got nothing. There's nothing that was he in a Twilight Zone episode? I'm sure he might have I, been. His face looks. Let me really see if familiar. I can. Let me see if I can find him. Cause... I think he was in Gunsmoke too, or something. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I read about him, and it seemed like he was in a lot of uh, soap Howard. opera stuff. Yeah. Uh yeah, I'm looking at Clint Howard so I can do this. But he looked he, oh. Bailey looked the the actor who played Bailey looked very familiar, but he also had yes. that kind of very 1960s actorly face. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, he was he was in an episode of The Twilight Zone. Yeah, I thought I saw um, him in that. He, he was in a little bit of everything for the 70s like The Fugitive Bonanza, uh Gunsmoke. Yep. Gunsmoke. Oh. Um, and then uh, his last episode or last uh, appearance was in 2002 in the FBI files. So that's that's interesting. Which I assume was some sort of X Files knockoff, or uh, uh, it was a TV series documentary. So who knows? It's like yeah. um, like um, True Detective or Murder She Wrote. No, Murder She Wrote. She's like, True Detective and Murder She Wrote are very different. Yeah, both also, excellent. He was also in One Life to Live. True Crimes. As true Herb Callison. Nice. I know we're all big fans of Herb Callison. Herb Callison. One Life to Live? Yeah. That's where I saw him. Are you a One Life to Live fan, Shirley? Uh, my mom was, so therefore by heritage, I guess I picked it up yeah. a little bit. Nice. Yeah, I, in Indiana, George, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, uh, soap operas are passed down by bloodline. That makes yeah. sense to me. Here, here's something that's going to be a tangent that I need to ask because it's been bothering me. And it's nothing to do with Star Trek. Is it an Indiana thing to refer to plastic bags as sacks? Yeah. They're not sacks? Um, no, it's very weird to me. Bags? Sacks? Really? Yeah. Oh, I don't need a sack for that. Yeah. Well, like, you, do come, is, you do come from the far off land of Cleveland. Do you say soda pop or Coke? Um, in Cleveland, soda? everyone says pop. I prefer soda because I think pop. it sounds better, but it's definitely soda pop. pop. I mean, your your town is where Howard the Duck lands. It is a foreign land, a strange land. Yeah, man. It's a good place. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll, t- we'll, we'll touch on the strange races. It's really just Baylock. I mean, but yeah. the, the puppet's kind of freaky. And they... Well, the thing is, he, like, Baylock is human. Oh, the puppet. Okay, no, I... Could... So I'm going to finish with the puppet's freaky and you never, until the very end, you don't really see it well. It's always on this weird, like warped video screen. Yeah. Like Spock kind of like hacks the monitor to allow them to visualize the alien. It's also, I love, I love how like Baylock is completely ruining everything that the the enterprise can do, except Spock can hack to see what he looks like. (laughs) Yeah. And then at a certain point he's just like, uh, I see that you've hacked my screens. You can just see me now, but it's still all like weird. Yeah. Um, um, so like there's the, there's the weird puppet alien Baylock and then the little kid weird Baylock who was also very weird. Um, the puppet is great because they used it. It's one of the images they use for the end credits. So like when you're a kid watching Star Trek, you know, or when I was a kid, 
I would always see that alien head. Mm-hmm. And okay. it was just so weird and strange. And it's like an image that really stuck with me that obviously they liked because, you know, they used it for the end credits. But, you know, it's just from the one episode and it's yeah. not even real in, in, in the <laughs> universe. <laughs> yeah. Didn't they use, don't they use like the butthead people too? From the cage? In the, the, in the end credits? Uh, in the end credits? I, I don't know. They might. Um, that sounds familiar. Maybe. <laughs> uh, so anything else that stuck out for you guys? Um, did you get the? Uh, oh, there were no, there were no colorful caves this time. No cut co- what? Colorf- col- colorful uh, caves. Colorful caves. Colorful. What does that even mean? Caves. Like in most of the episodes that we've seen so far, if they've been on. Well, but they didn't go down to a planet col- though. Col- colorful Jeez. caves. Oh my God. I'm just gonna stop talking right now. Carbomite. Yeah. I can say carbomite. Carbomite. Gah. Corbo might. <laughs> you Corbo. still don't have it. It's awesome. Corbo might maneuver. I liked um, Kirk getting stress tested at the beginning <laughs> on that weird, like, <laughs> inverted stair stepper thing. And then how yeah. he, as the captain of the ship, casually walks from his physical through hallways full of his subordinates with his shirt off, just like glistening with sweat, just like, yeah, I'm about that. You know? yeah. 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 I was so. It was like, was like regulations like, is he must be lax. To do that? Yeah. <laughs> well, the Federation's weird about that. Like that gets more in next generation where they're just very casual about things. Uh-huh. And in this one, I think is just an excuse to show Sh- Shatner with no shirt on. But it was just like that's that's wild. Yeah, especially for the time. Um. Yeah. There's uh. There's a lot of good back and forth between Kirk and McCoy and Kirk and Spock. Yes. Mm-hmm. If this is the third episode they filmed, like, this is really early on and really well done. Yeah. Um, they they banter quite well, so. Yeah, there's this great part where, um, I don't remember, it, it, it comes maybe about a third of the way in, where there's a scene where Kirk is talking to Spock, and Spock is saying, like, I don't have any logical... Like, we're, we're trapped. I don't see any logical way out of this. And Kirk is just kind of bouncing ideas off of him. And then Spock's like, why do you always ask me these things when you know that there's, you know, that my responses will, will not change your opinion whatsoever. You've already decided on a course of action. And Kirk just kind of grins and is like, for emotional stability. And then the next scene, he's talking to McCoy. And McCoy's talking to him about how he's been, you know, riding people too hard. And it was just a great thing where it's like, here's his relationship with spock immediately followed by here's the relationship with mccoy and it's totally different um whereas him and spock are more friendly but also more kind of at odds and mccoy is almost more of a fatherly kind of guy not quite that yeah kirk's still a superior yeah. but he's more willing to kind of be more mean to kirk or a little bit more cut and dry like you're doing something yeah. wrong here he's a little bit more fiery and it really it really showed the difference in relationships it was a great great moment i thought with yeah. all three of yeah. them yeah it's it. There's some. I, I I really like exactly what's going on uh, between them. I also Kirk has a couple of lines that are really good outside of that. Um, when he says uh, we grow annoyed at your foolishness, and he's not, <laughs> like he's totally bluffing. It's so it, it's over the top enough, but that's Shatner, and it's very heavy Shatner. But it's so good. I really like that. That one stuck with me. Yeah, when he starts bluffing the alien, when he starts bluffing Balok. His Shatnerisms really came out, but it sounded great because it sounded like a guy trying to be cocky and trying to fake it. And it was, it's where his, like, his artistic, his his actorly talents really played well into that scene and, and sold it really well. Yeah, like, enough of the foolishness and then, you know, he cuts them off, like, drops the transmission. Perfect, yeah, Kirk. Didn't, um, he did Shakespeare. He did a lot of Shakespeare, didn't he? Yeah, he was a Shakespearean actor. Yeah. And... I felt like that kind of showed through right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think overall, like, there's some good stuff here. Scotty gets a couple of moments and, and is shown to know mm-hmm. his ship, so, so that's good. We haven't seen him much of that. Like, he's been kind of a sideline yeah. character for a while. Um, Did you talk about the, um, this is the first time that we saw the tractor beam? Not tractor beam. Phasers? Oh yeah, we did. The phasers came out. That was kind of awesome. Yeah. Uh, we saw the remastered version, because that's what Netflix has. Um, because they're uh, originally red. Hmm. Um, oh, if you get on if you get on uh, memoryalpha.org and start going through there, it shows the changes between the ships and uh, or between the shots and what they look like. The the uh, the cube is much better 
rendered and brighter. Um, the phasers are white in the remastered version instead of the old red. Like the that. big the big Fisarius ship mm-hmm. looks imposing instead of slightly like some popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> like a popcorn ball. Yeah, it does kind of look like a popcorn ball. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's some there's some clear differences, and I, I really do like I did like the white phaser shots. Um, it feels a little a little weird to see him coming out of the one spot, but I keep forgetting this isn't, you know, next generation. So, um, yeah, that's kind of, that kind of touches all that. Oh, one one more thing is is when they were doing the, uh, when the ship is getting rocked because they're like running the engines really hot. And so everyone's kind Mm -hmm. of like rolling around and, you know, Mm -hmm. getting knocked back and forth. There's just this, there's the shot of everyone on the bridge kind of like flailing about, which, you know, that's normal. But then there's this shot of them all in the hallway, just random crew, like falling against one, one, one side of the hallway and then falling against the other side. And I'm just like, it's red alert. Like, why aren't you inside in a room? Yeah. Somewhere. Strapped down or something. Terrible. Yeah. Starfleet's always been really bad about the idea of having seat belts and, you know, actually fitting their ships out for combat, which is always very funny to me. Yeah. Uh this this episode was nominated for a Hugo Award in 1967 as best dramatic pr- presentation. So, yeah, it was good, I it guess. It had to be that foolishness line. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I think that this is one of the best episodes of Star Trek, the original series actually. Not like uh, yeah. top 5, but it's one that I really find enjoyable. Yeah, you know, honestly, we haven't seen a bad episode yet. I know they're coming, but so far, not not they're one. They're not coming. I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. They, they are. They Spock's are. Brain. Um, the only thing better than that child as uh, uh, that that Clint Howard playing Baylock is uh, Henry Mud. Oh, or yeah. Harry Mud. Harry Mud. Well, something I like about this is Harry that Mudd. in a lot of the original series, and even in a lot of Next Generation, they're you know they they meet these godlike figures that are essentially omnipotent. And a lot of the times it just comes off as magic. And here it was essentially a godlike figure that could just basically control their own ship with, you know, just one guy and whatever. But it wasn't – sometimes the godlike stuff irritates me because it's mm-hmm. – it becomes a little bit too much in the realm of fantasy or they're just too far advanced that I'm just not buying it. It's kind of boring. And this one I think it plays up, you know, this unconquerable threat um, in a much more interesting way to me that it's, you know, it's just someone that's – a civilization that's just more advanced. And it's revealed to be Clint Howard, so I like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, all right, let's get into our recurring items. Is, is that okay? Do you have anything left, Shirley? No, no? I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Um, we get a bones. I'm not. I'm a doctor. Not. Um, what did he well, say? Well, he didn't. Say well, he didn't quite have that not. construction. Yeah. Yeah, he was close. I think, I think we he's haven't gotten trying to work his way into it. They're trying to figure out the wording. Yeah, he hasn't. He hasn't done anything uh, like that. He said, "What am I, a doctor or a moon shuttle conductor?" <laughs> Which it, it's it's pretty it close. Was close. So I I kind of I'm okay with it. So um, it's as close as we've gotten so far. Uh, nobody died, so Bones couldn't say he was dead. So that also means no redshirt deaths. Uh, there is no lady for Kirk to get, although they again hint at the romance between uh, Yeoman Rand yes. and Captain Kirk. Captain I would Kirk argue that after he lady. walked through the tunnel with his shirt off, he actually got everybody in that scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Spock is extremely logical, suggesting that uh, people have their adrenal gland removed. Yeah, that's <laughs> or a great their adrenaline removed. Yeah, that's that a great moment. That. Um, and then Uhura just answers the phone. It's, yeah, you know, it's her first outing. It's kind of disappointing, but, yeah, uh, a lot of hailing things. frequencies are open, Captain. Yeah, yeah. We don't get to see, I don't know if you've watched the rest of these episodes, George, but, uh, in a previous episode, she totally hits on Spock, and then, uh, also she sings in a totally different episode. She sings all seductive as well. It's, it's impressive. To Spock. To Spock, yeah. Interesting. Um, so those are, those so, are good ones. Yeah, because when um, the new, the like the newer, the new versions of Star Trek, the um, the re, what are remastered, they the Abrams yeah. Star Treks. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The Abrams Star Treks, like uh, when um, Uhura and Spock were revealed to have a relationship, I was like, what? Where did they get that from? That's yeah. just like totally off the whatever. But and apparently then, not. Yeah, I know. Watching the first couple of episodes of the original series, like, she has the hots for him. And I'm like, what? How come I don't remember this? Yeah. So, it was uh, kind of interesting. 
Yeah, anything else you guys want to touch on on the episode? Of... What about fascinating? Isn't it the sp- first time Spock says fascinating? Oh. Uh, this is the first time that Spock almost says an emotional I'm sorry, and yeah. then recorrects himself to say some big, huge, long paragraph yeah. of a logical statement. Yeah. <laughs> He does drop a fascinating, though, when he first sees the, the big ship. He does. Yeah. He does. Um, <laughs> the Carbo, Cor- Corbomite bluff is reused again in Season 2 in the Deadly Years hmm. nice. against the Romulans. So there's something to look forward to. Um, but yeah, I think this is that, that kind of touches on everything. I, I do have one thing, which is that Baylock presents himself as being part of the First Federation, which is a really cryptic statement in light of, you know them working for, I guess, the Second Federation. And I don't know if there's any comic book or novel that's ever followed up on that. But I'd love to know, what's the deal with the First Federation? Mm. And Baylock runs the ship by himself. Right. Like, what was he doing? What Out there. What's the, is there an actual First Federation, or was he just BSing that? Um, what is his actual civilization like? Do they all look like weird baby men like him? Yeah, I... I... I I'm not seeing anything in the script or anything that suggests that. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It just um, maybe Shirley has some information in her giant book of books. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chipples. Yes, actually, these books were uh, were acquired um, on the um, half price market by Mr. Chipples for us. Um, and did, did, they did you... they are amazing. Like yeah. the amount of knowledge and just side facts in here about these episodes, I love it. I could sit here and read it all day long, just like you know a story. Did nice. you see anything in there where they kind of get in, into anything about Balok or his? That's that's what I'm that's what I'm kind of looking through. Because I don't think that there was. No. Um. In my own personal headcanon, as soon as McCoy and Kirk beam back to the ship, Bailey commits suicide. Really? I don't like that headcanon. <laughs> it's I, I it's think... not a it's not a wonderful thing. No, it... I think I think as soon as they beam back, uh Bailey begins to come become God and then he comes back in Star Trek uh um five. Oh, you mean so uh Baylock eventually gets a note with Bailey and imprisons him at Sharaki or whatever they call it. Yeah, yeah, and he becomes God. I like that. That works. Wow. Yeah. All right. What? You guys have this all tied up. What if? Well, that's that's a that's a thing for another. I don't want to spoil ahead, anything in Next Generation. If? Oh no, no, this is a this is a Wesley Crusher. Oh yeah, the travel. traveler or whatever. Yeah. What if Wesley Crusher is God? And he actually traveled back in time to be part of Star Trek V, and he was God there. If if Wesley Crusher was God, then Picard would he would have made Picard love Wesley Crusher. That's true, and he clearly did. This is true. Fair enough. All right, uh, I think that'll yeah, do. No, I can't find anything. So <laughs> I think that'll that'll kind of do us. Uh, George, where can we find you? You can follow me uh, on Twitter at the Chimples. That's the C H I M P L E S. Um, listen to me at Lizard People Dear Readers. You can find us at lizardpeopledearreaders.com or on Twitter at drlizardpeople. Uh, you can come and just hang out with me if you ever see me just uh, hanging about. I'll probably, uh, I don't know, say hi or something. Be you lizardy. You can, you can find out what my face looks like by looking into the night sky. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. I think that'll do us tonight, guys. And we will talk to you guys real soon. Bye bye. And that'll do us tonight for There Are Four Lights! Remember, you can email us at There Are Four Lights Podcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Nerds Domain, on Twitter at Nerds Domain, or over at our site, nerdsdom.com. Be sure to sign up for the newsletter while you're there. You can head over to iTunes and give us a five star rating. A big thanks to Five Year Mission for their music. You can find them at 5yearmission.net. Don't forget you can support us at patreon.com forward slash nerdsdomain. And check out our shirts at Slash Loot.